which is great. Welcome to the 14th Kesterton Lecture. It's one of two public lectures that the School of Journalism and Communication does every year. Um, the other one, the Paula Tala Lecture, is in honor of one of our late faculty members. And it uh, was about three weeks ago at the Graduate Student Conference uh, downtown. Uh, the Kesterton Lecture is named after Wilf Kesterton, who was uh, the key figure in the early days in the growth of Carleton's journalism program. He was born in 1914, and he was initially a teacher. He joined the Army in 1942 as a private and remained in the Army until 1947. At that point, he came to study at Carleton, which many of you, I'm sure, know as Canada's oldest journalism school, and at that time uh, had only been operating for a couple of years. In 1949, Will Kesterton became the second faculty member hired by the school, and he taught media law and other subjects to virtually every student at the school until his retirement in 1979. He stayed as a professor emeritus till 1986, and he died in 1997. He was an extraordinary teacher, uh, a, a pioneer in the writing of journalism history in Canada, and also played a great role in examining the relationship between journalism and the law, which is an issue that continues to draw lots of attention and uh, interest. Shortly after his death, the school launched a major fundraising campaign, supported by many of our graduates, to create the Kesterton Endowment Fund, which, among other things, supports this lecture. Uh, it's the second uh, Kesterton lecture we've hosted in our new home, the River Building, um, and it's nice that it's late enough in the year that you can actually see some of the sights outside rather than coming here when it's dark, because it's quite a spectacular location, and the river's pouring down at the moment. Um, we hope we're not going to be flooded. I don't think we will, but um, our stool's more than 65 years old, but this is the first time we've had a, occupied a building that was designed specifically for us, and it gives the school the tools and the surroundings we need to teach journalism in the 21st century. Um, our new building is already a showcase for the university, and it's a great home for events like this tonight. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is the 14th Kesterton Lecture, and for the last few years we've concentrated our journalism uh, on journalism and international events. Matthew Fisher talked about Canada and Afghanistan. Greg Ipp talked about the U.S. economy. Elizabeth Palmer last year spoke about social media and the Arab Spring. We're happy to continue that tradition tonight with a look through Canadian eyes at China, a subject that comes up about every 10 seconds after you start a discussion about any international, economic, social, geopolitical, environmental, cultural, or military issue. The school was involved, is also involved in international journalism in other ways, um, including our African internship program for students, started by Alan Thompson, the other person who was carrying the, uh, the benches with me, and also through the Travers Fellowship that honors the late former columnist, editor, and foreign correspondent, Jim Travers from the Toronto Star, the Ottawa Citizen, and Southern News. Um, the fellowship, that fellowship annually provides a Canadian journalist with $25,000 to study and report to Canadians on an international issue that affects Canada. Last fall, the first winner, Katie DeRosa, traveled to Australia and Thailand to examine how Australia deals with human smuggling. Canada was contemplating modeling its approach on the Australian detention camps model. Her stories were published in a series by her employer, the Victoria Times columnist, carried by Post Media across the country uh, and its chain, and was also, the stories were an audible mention for the 2000, 2013 Canadian Hillman Prize, which honours excellence in journalism in service of the common good. Two weeks ago, we announced the second winner of the Travers Fellowship, Mike Blanchfield from the Canadian Press. He'll be travelling to Geneva, um, it's now April, so it's later this month, follow Canada's stance and involvement in negotiations on an international treaty to ban cluster bombs. Uh, it's a follow-up to the landmine treaty of the late 1990s. He'll then go to Southeast Asia to report on the impact these deadly weapons have had on civilians of all ages, years and even decades after war's end. With Mike's 15 years of international reporting, we're confident his work will be a, a finalist for awards in the coming year as well. Um, a common theme underlies both the Travers Fellowship and the lecture series. They're both, and this lecture series, they're both based on the belief that even in the internet age, the core and essence of journalism remains what it's always been. Uh, being there, seeing things for yourself, talking to those involved and reporting to your audience what you see, hear, know, understand, analyze, and conclude. About five years ago, just before the Beijing Olympics, one of our graduates, Jeffrey York, who was then the Beijing correspondent for the Globe and Mail, spoke to our Kruger College's annual dinner. He, his message was blunt. At a time when everyone was predicting the Olympics would be a catalyst that would move China towards democracy and human rights, Jeff said there was no chance that was going to happen anytime soon. 
If our speaker tonight doesn't update that prediction in his comments, feel free to ask him in the question period that will follow. <laughs> Mark McKinnon, also a Carleton Journalism graduate from 1997, arrived in Beijing to take up his post on the last day of those Olympics. He's currently Beijing bureau chief for the Globe and Mail. Before China, he was posted in Moscow and Jerusalem, and has reported from throughout Asia, Southeast Asia, and the Middle East in that time period. He's a four-time National Newspaper Award winner, also the author of The New Cold War, Revolutions, Rigged Elections, and Pipeline Politics in the Former Soviet Union, published in 2007 by Random House. In a couple of months, he'll wind up his term in China and move to London to become a senior international correspondent covering international affairs for the Globe and Mail starting in the fall. It's been an extraordinary almost five years for the world and for China as well. Mind-boggling changes have taken place in the country in that period, yet parts of China remain almost unchanged from decades ago. It's that disparity and dichotomy that Mark has covered in tremendous depth and scope over his term in China. More recently, he's chronicled that so well in the Globe series China Diaries over recent months, and his train trip through the country, the highlights of which appeared last weekend in the newspaper, and I think he'll probably tell you it's going to become an e-book as well. Um, our faculty takes great pride in the accomplishments of our graduates, and it's with particular pleasure that we welcome them back to tell us what they've seen, learned, and concluded. Please welcome this year's Kesterton Lecturer, Mark McKinnon. Hi, thank you all for coming tonight. I'd like to thank Chris Waddell for the very nice introduction and uh, all of you for uh, choosing to spend your Wednesday afternoon with me, or Wednesday evening. Um, it's a fabulous opportunity for me to come back to Carleton University uh, and lecture some of those who once lectured me. <laughs> and um, if that wasn't me, you fell asleep in the back of your class and killed St. Pat's building. The Kesterton Lecture has drawn some great speakers in the past, and you heard some of their names right now. Last year, the fabulously talented Liz Palmer gave this address. But I should state from the beginning, and I tried to tell Chris this, that I'm no Liz Palmer. Liz stands on Takayo Square, unfazed by the chaos around her, and tells millions of people what, calmly what's happening and what it means to them. I'm one of those who needs to read what they write before they know what they think. <laughs> by the time I get around to the part of my day where I'm writing down what I think, I'm alone with my laptop and usually my cat. Sometimes the cat walks out. I <laughs> hope you'll be more patient than my cat. <laughs> and forgive me if I have to read what I think. Um, as for the topic, notes from a changing China. I haven't promised very much in specific, obviously, and I did that on purpose, mindful of something that the CBC's Patrick Brown, another one of those easy-talking TV types, said to me when I first came to Beijing five years ago, almost five years ago, four and a half years ago. Essentially, his warning was this. Anybody who makes a declarative statement about China can easily prove themselves right, and just as easily be proven a liar by others. Here's a few examples of what Patrick meant. China is a dictatorship. China is democratizing. China's economy is the engine of global growth. China's economy is a bubble that's sure to pop. China's the world's biggest polluter. China leads the world in green energy. China is rising peacefully. China's a threat to its neighbors. The Chinese people don't care about politics. There were 180,000 protests last year in the country. All of these statements are true, even if many of them are contradictory. <coughs> China is really that big. So to, get, to condense things a little, I'll start off by talking about the trip that uh, Chris mentioned that I took around China earlier this year. It was 22 days and almost 8,000 kilometers on the rails. Um, it, it began this way. I, in the Globe and Mail's office in Beijing, actually we squat in the kitchen of the CTV office, <laughs> but that's another story. But it's, um, I keep a list of all the places I need to visit, all the stories that I want to write. And as you can imagine, when you're covering a country of 1.3 billion people, that list keeps growing. One afternoon, I decided to plot the most important undone China stories on a map. And by complete chance, we came up with this arc, which quite accidentally almost traced the route of the long march that Mao Zedong and his Red Armies had taken eight, days, eight decades earlier in a very different China. You throw in my long-standing love of taking the train, and it's quite inexplicable how much I like a cabin full of sleeping strangers snoring beside me. <laughs> and an idea was born. And strangely enough, the Global Mail agreed to pay for this. I won't um, talk too much about the individual stops of the journey right now. Um, 1999, you can get subscription to the Global Mail. <laughs> um, but we started in Wukan. Let's see. Oh, have I got the right one here? There we go. It's 
hey, hidden under the music signal down there. Um, it's a tiny fishing village in coastal Guangdong province in the southeast of that map that saw a miniature de democratic revolution in late 2011. Just over a year later, the villagers I met were realizing that their victory, which had seen them rise up and win the right to freely choose their own village council for the right time, didn't mean very much. Um, all the villagers, of, uh, the villagers in Wukan have been allowed to do was elect a tiny brick that would be placed at the bottom of China's power pyramid. The reasons why they rose up, land that had been unfairly seized by corrupt officials and sold to developers, couldn't be fixed by any local council. From Wukan, I headed north to the big city of Changsha, got to, oh, sorry, Guangzhou, arriving in the midst of an editorial strike at Southern Weekly, which is part of China's bravest and most important newspaper group. The day I was there saw small protests in support of the striking journalists, not organized by any force, but by ordinary Chinese who had lost their homes, their jobs, their freedom. Whoop, I've got two things to move at once. It's very confusing. Because they tried to stand up to corrupt and capricious local officials. They saw Southern Weekly as the only media outlet in China that would tell their stories, the only way they could hope to seek justice in a system hopelessly tilted against them. I'll come back to that theme a lot later. From Guangzhou, we took China's new 300 kilometer an hour super train north, whooshing through rice paddies and past villages of stone homes that looked to be from a different China than the uh, different century than the China I live in. We arrived in Mao Zedong's home province of Hunan, where we experienced firsthand how one of history's greatest mass murderers is still revered in 2013. We met crowds of people who believed that he was a deity somewhere in the sky, able to answer the prayers of those who lived today in the People's Republic that he founded. Then we traveled south by slow coach to China's poorest province, Guizhou, where the still nominally communist country's gap between rich and poor is at its widest and most dangerous. We visited a school that had no lights, no heat, no chalk, like their parents a generation before. The students in Wanzhou, the village here, had no chance to compete with those growing up a world away in Beijing and Shanghai. The sad irony of Wanzhou is that the left behind students there are the direct descendants of China's great teacher, Confucius. Then we headed on an overnight train to the fast-changing city of Chongqing, where Prime Minister Stephen Harper visited not so long ago to meet a panda named Arshun and a politician named Bo Xilai. Both the panda and the politician have been in captivity ever since. <laughs> <laughs> then it was west to the edge of the Tibetan Plateau, where over the past two years more than 100 monks and lay people have felt so desperate that they lit themselves on fire often shouting the name of the Dalai Lama as their final act. My trip ended in northern Shanxi province, in a village called Liangjiahe, where China's new leader, Xi Jinping, had spent his teenage years. He was what they called a sent-down youth, assigned to do farm labor after his, farmer, after his father, a communist hero named Xi Jiangsun, was purged near the start of the Cultural Revolution. When you talk about the potential for change in China, and my trip convinced me that at the very minimum, the legal system needs and must have a dramatic overhaul before popular anger spills over into something unpredictable. You need to talk about Xi Jinping and the moment that he now has as, six, as China's sixth paramount leader since the Communist Revolution in 1949. Standing there outside the cave house that Xi Jinping helped build for himself, I'm sorry we don't have a picture of it here, with its communist star in the year 1970 etched into the stone over the entrance. And from speaking to those who had worked in labor gangs with Xi Jinping, I couldn't help but think that China finally has a leader whose whole life has prepared him for this moment, has given him an understanding of this system in all its good and ill. Here's a man who fell to the absolute bottom of society, only to recover when his family was rehabilitated, and now he has risen to the very top. Here's a man whose father led the push for economic reforms during the era of Deng Xiaoping, who oversaw the creation of the Shenzhen Special Economic Zone, a project that turned a fishing village near Hong Kong into the shop window for China's opening to the world economy. Here's a man whose father wore a watch given to him by the Dalai Lama, long after it was fashionable, no longer fashionable or safe for a communist leader to do so. And here's a man whose father, if the anecdote circling in Beijing is to be believed, was the only senior communist leader to speak out against the Tiananmen Square crackdown in 1989. But here's a man we otherwise know very little about. Xi Jinping became the leader of the Communist Party in the military last fall and assumed the presidency less than a month ago today. But there are already stylistic changes that we can see and that I think bode well. I was sitting in the front, hall, the front row of the Great Hall of the People last fall when Xi Jinping walked in at the head of the new Standing Committee of the Politburo. 
Frankly, it was easy to be cynical. Seven men in suits, all of whom chosen by a backroom deal that has more in common with the way neighborhoods are divvied up on The Sopranos than the internal democracy the Communist Party claims. By my watch, the new Politburo Standing Committee walked out at 11.46 a.m. on November the 18th, the same moment on the same day, down to the minute, that Hu Jintao had led his Politburo into the same room to meet the public a decade before, in 2002. There's stability, and then there's nervous superstition. The Communist Party of China is obsessed with the former and consumed by the latter. But my eyes stopped rolling when Xi Jinping spoke. First of all, he apologized, kind of, for keeping everybody waiting. It was a little thing, but there haven't been too many instances when the Communist Party has apologized to anybody, to anybody for anything. Secondly, he just sounded like a nice, ordinary guy. And that's obviously a very superficial analysis, but similar remarks rippled across the Chinese internet as soon as their genial new leader, who was so very different from the wooden Hu Jintao, started talking. And if it's possible for an authoritarian president to have a honeymoon pu uh, period with the public, Mr. Xi has that right now. I was back in the Great Hall of the People again last month when the Communist Party's number two figure, Li Keqiang, gave his, new press, gave his first press conference as the country's new premier. Actually, it was less of a press conference the way a journalism student might expect than it was a scripted play. The only questions asked by foreign journalists were those pre-approved by the foreign ministry. My colleagues were laughing at me for stubbornly sitting there with my hand up, like Li Keqiang might point and go, the Canadian in the back. <laughs> but what Li said was noteworthy. He talked about the corruption epidemic that's rotting at everything from the Communist Party's credibility, to the safety of China's public infrastructure, to the trustworthiness of its factory exports, and the edibility of its food. The words gutter oil probably don't mean anything here, but when you're going to a Beijing restaurant, you fear it. But it wasn't just that he was blunt about the country's problems. Previous Communist Party leaders have done that. But he promised a self-imposed revolution and laid down three basic promises that the public could actually measure his government's performance by. He said that no new government buildings would be constructed, that the civil service would shrink rather than grow over the next five years, and that spending on lavish official banquets and travel would be reined in. And then, crucially, he welcomed the public and the media to help scrutinize whether those tasks were achieved. It will be a breakthrough for China if these promises are kept and the public and the media are allowed to play their roles in doing so. So far, these changes are only stylistic. The nature of the regime remains intact. The internet controls are still there. I waste so much time every day trying to get onto Twitter and Facebook. And so is the strict surveillance of known opponents in the one-party system. On the day Li was made premier and giving this very optimistic sounding talk, Hu Jia, a democracy activist who is one of the bravest people that I've met anywhere, was detained and roughed up by police as punishment for criticizing the way that Xi Jinping and Li Keqiang had been chosen without consulting the people. This is still the same nervous police state that overreacted to online calls for a demonstration. There was a call for a Middle Eastern-inspired jazz and revolution on the Wang Fujing pedestrian mall two years ago. They flooded the center of Beijing with police and tackled anyone who dared to go to the designated protest site, which was a McDonald's restaurant on a Sunday afternoon. So you can imagine how some people just got, were just trying to buy a filet of fish <laughs> But China's new premier talked of reforming China's labor camp system, which has been used to punish dissidents without the bother of a trial since the Mao Zedong era. The new president has talked about the need to put power, the Communist Party's power, inside what he dubbed a cage of regulations. Maybe change in China will continue step by step. No lurches, no jasmine revolutions, no Tiananmen's. That's actually the hopeful assessment I get when I return to the campus of Beijing University, the seat of the 1989 unrest, and talk to the students from the Tiananmen plus 20 generation. The students have met know why their predecessors, the students of 1989, took to the streets. They also know, contrary to the Western myth, a lot about what happened on June 4th, 1989, when the tanks were sent in to crush the pro-democracy protests. But they weren't ready to repeat that challenge to authorities, in large part because they believe the country is progressing, however slowly, in the right direction. They're willing to wait, at least for a while longer. It's important when discussing China to stop and take the long view from time to time. Let's ponder that. <laughs> I traveled undercover, posing as a Russian historian to North Korea in 2009. Today's Pyongyang is not unlike Mao's China. Poor, afraid, empty, hopeless, and as we've seen this week, belligerent. From North Korea, today's China looks like a wonderland of freedoms and opportunity. 
When photographer Sean Gallagher and I returned to China at the end of our paranoid five-day stay in Pyongyang, during which we were questioned every evening about our stories, at one point I was asked to name the group of seven painters just to prove I was Canadian. <laughs> and Sean was accused of not being British because he couldn't remember when put on the stop, or when put on the spot, what year the Tower of London was built. <laughs> he said he wasn't good at history, so they, they said, well, what, what were you good at? And he said, I was really good at science. So he said, well, what's the definition of a vacuum? <laughs> <coughs> Obviously, even the intelligence services aren't online there. <laughs> The two of us were laughing out loud and almost kissed the tarmac when we landed back at Beijing Airport. <laughs> Freedom, Sean said, and it wasn't quite a joke. The most positive change I've seen in my time in China has been the ever more honest discussion of the country's environmental problems, and with it the question of how much quality of life the country wants to sacrifice in the name of economic development. The first day I spent in Beijing, as Chris mentioned, was the last day of the 2008 Summer Olympics. The air was clear, the city was at its friendly best, my wife and I sat in the Temple of the Earth Park with my predecessor, Jeffrey York, watching the closing ceremonies of the Games on a giant screen television. I read about China's giant struggle to clean up in time for the Olympics, and the long-distance runners who said they wouldn't compete in Beijing, and I thought, what was the fuss all about? Whatever problems there had been, they had been fixed in time to host the spectacular Games. It turned out that the, air, the clean air I was breathing was a magic trick, achieved partly through shutting down factories in and around Beijing, and sharply curbing the number of cars allowed to be on the road. Plus, the wind happened to be blowing the right direction for almost the entire duration of the Games. Over the next four years, we discovered what the fuss had been about. I worked in Cairo and Jakarta, two of the grimiest cities on the planet, but neither can touch Beijing's bad air days when the smog is so thick that it can literally become impossible to see the high-rise tower across the street. And that's not an exaggeration. Those days we call our home city Mordor, after the eternally dark realms in the Lord of the Rings. <coughs> the other morning, my three-year-old daughter woke me up with the news that it's a pollution day today, Daddy. We have to wear our masks. Sad stuff. Um, and I'm not the only parent who's wondering what, whether it's fair to raise their child there. Infuriatingly, the Chinese government has re uh, uh, refused to treat its citizens like adults. The official media for the first four years I was based there would call these days fog, when it was clearly nothing of the sort. Weather maps printed in the newspapers said the air quality was moderate, 365 days out of 365, giving the same reading whether the, clear, the sky was clear blue or impenetrably gray. And for the most part, they were successfully fooling their people. Taxi drivers would roll their eyes if I asked them to close their window on a bad air day. My, co my co-workers in the CTV office and Globe and Mail kitchen would shut the windows when I walked in on a bad air day, but I knew they would reopen them as soon as I left. The first crack in that wall of mind control that's what the sky looks like in Beijing. <laughs> the first crack in that wall of mind control came thanks to the U.S. Embassy in Beijing, which started a Twitter account in 2008 under the handle at Beijing Air. That guy is Xi Jinping. There we go. Leave him. Every hour, at Beijing Air, post the air quality readings taken by the embassy in the same part of East Beijing that I live in, I should let it go black, and gives a curt analysis. Sometimes the air is good, or at least moderate, which means something less than 100 AQI. This is an index that uh, we treat like uh, uh, wind, chill? wind chill factor. That's right. We get up in the morning, we all look at the air quality index instead of the wind chill factor. I've been gone too long, obviously. <laughs> Other days it was unhealthy for sensitive groups, or just plain unhealthy. In the fall of, the year, uh, uh, fall of 2009, a year after the Olympics and Paralympics had ended, the readings were over 300 with alarming regularity. The U.S. Embassy bluntly tweeted out in those days that the, day, that the air was outright hazardous. The top of the scale was supposed to be 500, but in November 2011, the U.S. Embassy equipment showed a, re a reading of 522. At a loss for, the, for words, somebody in the Embassy tweeted out that the air was hashtag crazy bad. <laughs> I think the description was perfectly apt, but it wasn't a very diplomatic way of putting it. China's foreign ministry complained bitterly about U.S. In interference as domestic affairs. The diplomatic crossfire, though, caught the attention of citizens on Sino Weibo, China's own Twitter-like social networking service. And people began to debate what their government was and wasn't telling them about the air. <laughs> By this January, we saw a nightmarish stretch, two weeks of 500-plus air quality, including one day where it hit an unfathomable 755. Most Chinese I know are no longer snickering about the foreigners and their crazy science. 
They have air quality monitors on their smartphones, and they put on masks on the days when it's hashtag crazy bad outside. <laughs> Most importantly, the government that once lied to them is being forced to respond to public pressure to deal with the air. We shouldn't, this is a quote, we shouldn't pursue economic growth at the expense of the environment, since such growth won't satisfy the people. That was from Lee Kachang at his first press conference. And that's another important breakthrough. Again, maybe change in China will come step by step. But you can see how important the U.S. involvement and the blunt telling of the truth was. If I put this thesis of slow but steady progress to a dissident like Ai Weiwei, he'd say, yeah, but. But nothing is really changing. But Liu Xiaobo, the democracy activist who won the 2010 Nobel Peace Prize, is still in prison. Putting his name on a short list with the likes of Andrei Sakharov and An Sung Suu Kyi as Nobel laureates who were unable to accept their prizes. Ai Weiwei himself remains under an Orwellian house arrest. He's free as he, to do as he pleases within the confines of his courtyard, art, uh, courtyard home and art studio, but he's under surveillance the second he opens the front gate. Which, oddly enough, brings me to Canada's relationship with China. You guys have good water here. <laughs> should we engage in this slowly changing China that Li and Xi are steering, or should we stand with the Ai Weiwei's and the Liu Xiaobo's? When I arrived in China, the Harper government had perhaps the toughest policy towards China of any major country. Ottawa spoke out about human rights violations. Parliament gave honorary citizenship to the Dalai Lama. Mr. Harper's decision not to attend the 2008 Olympics was read in Beijing as a snub, and the PM famously promised not to sell out Canadian values to the almighty dollar, as he oh. called it. It was an attention-grabbing policy that did nothing but ensure that no one in China saw or heard anything about Canada. We didn't matter. Canadian companies lost trade opportunities. The human rights situation didn't get any better. But now I worry that we've gone too far the other way. I covered Prime Minister Harper's first visit to Beijing in December 2009, when he met a famously chilly Premier Wen Jiabao. Some saw Premier Wen as chastising Harper, but I thought, progress, we're talking again. <laughs> it was the Prime Minister's return trip last year, which was viewed as a major success back home, that actually made me a bit queasy. Most will remember the visit only for the pandas, or perhaps because Mr. Harper was the last person to see Bo Xilai alive. But um, he has since been uh, he's being charged with uh, helping uh, cover up a murder as well as massive corruption. He hasn't been charged, I should say. He's uh, in the legal system somewhere. Arshun and Geely, the pandas we received, were adorable, although we've since learned that Geely couldn't make it to Canada because she was less male than we originally believed her to be. <laughs> what Mr. Harper didn't do in China was publicly say the word Tibet or speak up for, for the Dalai Lama that he once proudly made a Canadian citizen. He didn't publicly visit a church, something his own Office of Religious Freedom would probably frown on. He didn't mention Liu Xiaobo, not even when I asked Mr. Harper a specific question about the Jail Nobel Laureate at a press conference in the Chongqing Panda Enclosure, a very fitting place. I asked Mr. Harper if he'd raised Mr. Liu's case, or that of jailed Uyghur Canadian Hussein Chalil, whose disappearance was once a front burner issue in Ottawa Beijing relations. And the Prime Minister replied by referring to the two individuals you mentioned. Notice the deliberate refusal to use either man's name. Now, some will say, so what? The Canadian Prime Minister is in China to promote Canadian trade, not human rights in China. If he offended his host by talking about the people they keep in their jails, all the positive momentum in Beijing-Ottawa ties over the past few years could have been lost. Perhaps. But German Chancellor Angela Merkel, who visited China the same month as Mr. Harper, made an appointment to have dinner with Mo Xiaoping, Liu Xiaobo's lawyer. She tried to visit Southern Weekend, the censorship-battling newspaper that went on strike earlier this year. Now, both visits were perhaps predictably blocked by Chinese authorities, but at least Ms. Merkel signals for her hosts that Germany still cared about issues beyond trade. And she did manage to visit an historic cathedral in Guangzhou. <clears throat> she let the world know that the issue of how China's government treats its people matters to Germany, and the ties between Berlin and Beijing would never be what they could be until China addressed those problems. And it has to be said, trade between Germany and China hasn't seemed to suffer. Promoting human rights in China is often a very simple case of promoting the use of the country's own laws. Liu Xiaobo is in jail for advocating that the Communist Party follow the constitution that it wrote without consulting its people. The Constitution that it contains a lot of very good ideas, with an enormous caveat in the preamble about the primacy of Communist Party rule. Hussein Chalil wasn't even arrested in China. He was seized in Uzbekistan in 2006 and extradited. He's been convicted of terrorism and sentenced to life in prison, although none of us here knows what evidence there is against him. 
When I spoke to Chen Guangcheng, the blind dissident who last year took refuge in, the, refuge in the U.S. Embassy in Beijing, I asked him if he had considered, even for a minute, taking refuge in the Canadian Embassy instead. He told me that while he had pondered several European countries, Canada had never crossed his mind. That made me a little sad. But I suppose I'm being ide idealistic here about foreign policy, so let's approach this from an angle of real politics. Let's put aside the talk of human rights for a moment and focus on cold Canadian interests. China is the biggest market in the world. That's why everyone from shipbuilders in Montreal to soybean growers in Manitoba to real estate developers in Vancouver are obsessed with trying to attract Chinese customers. Canadian businesses know they can't succeed if they don't know what the rules are in China. If the rules written in Beijing aren't enforced in Yunnan or Henan or Xinjiang, and if the law can be completely disregarded in Liu Xiaobo's case with all the international attention on it, it can just as easily be ignored when Canadian investors are being strong-armed or lied to by their partners. I believe the saga of Sino Forest, the Toronto listed uh, Chinese forestry company, demonstrates why it is crucial for Canada's political leaders to consistently push for the application of the rule of law in China. Not just an investor protection agreement like the one Canada and China signed last year, but a legal framework that means something to all Chinese citizens, protecting them from abuse. Because that will also protect foreigners visiting and doing business in China. The Foreign Investment Protection and Promotion Agreement, or the FIPA, as it's known, was the other great accomplishment of Stephen Harper's last trip to China. It was actually the result of decades of negotiations rather than a present to China's new friend. But I can promise you that having a FIPA or a FAPA or a FLIPA that seeks only to protect foreign investors won't mean very much in rural Yunnan if the local Communist Party boss doesn't think the laws, any laws, apply to him anyways. In the case of Sino Forest, this was a company started by an entrepreneur who partnered with a former forestry official. Together, they took advantage of China's land privatization drive to, slap, to snap up large swathes of forest land, often by paying off village officials to help them convince illiterate residents to sell their shares of the land for far less than what they were worth. The founders successfully bet that they could declare just about any value for their trees, and it would be hard for others to question their assertion. I met a government forestry official who told me that Sino Forest Holdings in Yunnan province were worth only a tiny fraction of what they had declared to Canadian investors. He laughed at me when I raised the suggestion that Sino Forest might have violated the Ontario Securities <coughs> Commission regulations. Our conversation went a little bit like this. So Sino Forest went to Canada and told everybody they had millions of dollars worth of forest properties here in Yunnan? Yes, I told him. And people believe them? Yes. Without coming here themselves to have a look? Yes. Well, whose fault is that? <laughs> In other words, why would you trust our system when we don't trust it ourselves? The case of Silvercorp, a Vancouver headquartered mining company that is in reality based in China's central Henan province, is even more troublesome. A Canadian research and short selling house called EOS sent an investigator to Henan province to determine whether Canadian investors had again been misled. Now, I'm no particular fan of these short selling companies. Their motives, are, their motives are impure, at least in the case of Muddy Waters, the one that did the initial Sino Forest research. I found their work to be sloppy and exaggerated. Their interest is less in getting the truth out there than being the ones who profit from the takedown. What happened to Huang Kun? He was the guy in the pink shirt who I can't seem to bring back right now. There you are. The researcher I interviewed in Beijing can't be justified. And it speaks again to the complete lack of rule of law and judicial independence in the country. Hong Kun is a 36-year-old Vancouverite. His friends call him Dino. He was sent to the city of Luoyang in Henan province in late 2011 to examine how and why a mine in the middle of nowhere was suddenly claiming to produce the highest grade silver in the world. He paid a local resident to go to the mine, take some photographs, collect the ore that fell off the trucks, and of course that ore didn't seem to match the high grade stuff that Silver Corp was claiming to come from the mine. The company, as it's entitled to do, pushed back hard when EOS released his findings attacking the short sellers' motivations and their methodology. Much of the market eventually agreed with Silvercorp, and its share price rebounded after a sharp dip. That's all fine. But when Dino tried to leave China via Beijing airport at the end of 2011, he was arrested and sent back to Luoyang. He was taken to a PSB office, put in a cell, and interrogated. I should explain here that the Public Security Bureau, or PSB, is a little bit like the old Soviet KGB, above the law even as it theoretically enforces it, and they come up a lot in the next little few paragraphs. I've seen videos and other evidence from the investigation, and what's clear to me is the PSB had an aim other than determining whether, the, whether Dino broke any laws when he was investigating Silvercorp. The most troubling thing I saw were receipts for the hotel rooms that the PSB officers used while they were interrogating Dino. 
The Fapyaos, a Chinese official term for a tax receipt, were made out to a subsidiary of Silver Corp. In other words, the company was subsidizing the police investigation into somebody that had bothered them. That's against Chinese law and the PSB's own internal guidelines. But despite the fact we printed that evidence in the Globe and Mail, which is available online in China, Dino remains behind bars eight months after we ran our story. The PSB officer has not been reprimanded. Silver Corp shares are still trade on the New York Stock Exchange. I've discovered in a very personal way how the laws of China can be bent by those who are expected to enforce them. In 2010, I became interested in how some surprisingly rich Chinese officials have been able to quickly and successfully immigrate to Canada. My focus fell on the investor immigration program, a system that allows immigrants to be fast-tracked if they can prove they have a certain amount of money in the bank and they're willing to invest a certain amount of that in Canada. As part of the screening process, applicants are supposed to show how they got that money so that Immigration Canada can be convinced they obtained their wealth legally. Most apply from China by immigration consulting companies, as they're known, that are all over Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, and Hong Kong. So I hired a Chinese friend with the right sort of accent uh, to call 23 of these companies and put a hypothetical situation to them. We were a quality control officer at a Chinese state-owned company, and we needed to go to Canada as quickly as possible. Our problem was this. While we had plenty of money in the bank, it had all arrived in a lump sum. Our official paychecks could never explain our wealth. And well, we hadn't been paying a lot in the way of taxes. <laughs> 18 of the 23 companies we called said they could help us falsify financial records so that it would look to Canadian officials like we had made the money steadily, paycheck by paycheck, over the years. We were told the tax records could be created too. Then we added an additional challenge. Can you also help my cousin, we asked. He's also got money, but uh, he went to jail once for stabbing a man. Most of the companies still on the phone at this point said there wasn't anything they could do for a man with a criminal record but four of the consulting firms said that even that problem could be fixed. One of them assured us that, quote, the Canadian government can't come to China to check the archives. Several days after the article ran, I got a call from the PSB. Could I come to their office in Beijing? They'd like to discuss the story. I went, expecting they might ask me for some of the names, the other names of the companies involved in this business. China was, after all, in the midst of a perennial, one of its perennial crackdowns on corruption. And I had named only four of the immigration consultancies in my article, but mentioned that 18 had been willing to help our fictional crooked official. That wasn't what they were interested in. I was taken to the basement of the PSB office and given a seat facing a panel of five police officers, only slightly more intimidating than you guys think. <laughs> One of them was holding a video camera, and another guy behind a curtain came out every now and again and videoed me from behind as well. They didn't want to know the names of the other 14 consultancies. They wanted to know who gave me the information on my story. Who made the phone calls? Who was the unnamed immigration consultant that I quoted speaking out against his corrupt colleagues? And bizarrely, did Jason Kenney make me write the story? <laughs> People who don't have my mobile number, Jason Kenney. <laughs> they demanded that I hand over my notes and recordings and threatened during one of the repeated questionings that followed. I ended up having five sessions in the basement of the PSB office to charge me with obstruction of justice if I didn't comply. At the very least, they vowed it would be difficult for me to renew my visa and my residence permit when they expired. Now, obviously, we didn't comply. Instead, I flew to Bangkok with all my notes and recordings and couriered them to Toronto. <laughs> and after speaking with my editors, we called the Chinese Foreign Ministry and said that the Globe and Mail, the first Western newspaper allowed to open an office in Mao Zedong, China, would close its bureau before it gave in to these pressure tactics. Eventually, the Foreign Ministry prevailed on the PSB, and the PSB stopped bothering me for a while. But why did it all happen? I later learned that one of the companies that we had named in print as offering to create false financial records and erase our cousin's criminal record was owned by a former top officer in the PSB. Even when caught breaking the law, he had the power to instead order a PSB investigation into the whistleblowers. The law didn't matter. And so yes, I think that Canada's leaders should talk about Liu Xiaobo when they're in Beijing, if only because Canadians and Canadian companies in China need them to. I've spent a lot of time in Burma over the past two years, watching in amazement as that country becomes a better place day by day, although we have seen some dangerous backsliding in recent weeks. The first time I entered the country was in early 2011. Journalists weren't very welcome then. It was still a military-ruled state, so I had to travel undercover. This time I was a businessman selling Canadian medication to Burmese pharmacies. It was an often nerve-wracking experience, and at one point I ended up changing my shirt and pulling on a ball cap in a restaurant bathroom and slipping out by the kitchen in the back of the restaurant in order to shake them in on motorcycles who had been following this medical salesman 
ever since he left the offices of Aung San Suu Kyi's National League for Democracy. A year later, when I was back in Rangoon to cover Aung San Suu Kyi's election to Parliament, after a free and unfettered election campaign marked by an enthusiasm for politics that developed democracies like Canada have long forgotten, then it was no problem to see Aung San Suu Kyi. The only trick was getting an appointment between all the diplomats and journalists and activists and businessmen who also wanted to see her. Coming back to China, I wonder if we'd be seeing this moment in Burma if Western leaders had agreed to stop talking about Aung San Suu Kyi, the way they've chosen to forget about Lucia Bo and his wife, Lucia. Before I move too far away from the topic of media harassment, and since someone decided to give me a microphone, I have a small complaint to put on the record. In the summer of 2009, deadly riots broke out in Urumqi, the same predominantly Uyghur Muslim city in China's western Xinjiang province that uh, Husayn Chilil's uh, family lives in. I flew out there to cover the angry aftermath of the riots, which had left almost 200 people dead. After a few days in Urumqi, I decided to push further out to the remote and ancient city of Kashgar, near China's border with Afghanistan. I spent a day touring the walled city of Kashgar, which is far more reminiscent of Central Asia and the Middle East than any other part of China. And I spoke to people there about the unrest in Urumqi, as well as Beijing's plans to demolish the old city of Kashgar and put up a more Chinese-looking downtown in its place. Then I checked into my hotel. Early the next morning, there was a knock. Bang, bang, bang on the door. Now, the panel beside my bed had a do not disturb switch, so I just leaned over and assumed it was housekeeping with flick, 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 flick. It didn't work. Whoever was outside pounded on the door again. Eventually, I got up and answered the door, and in the hallway were four men, three of them in police uniforms. Ma Kai, they asked, using my Chinese name. They told me I had to immediately leave Kashgar for my own safety. Desperate to buy some more time in the city, and knowing there was no greater crime in China than being forced to skip a meal, I complained that it was unfair to deport me until I'd had the free breakfast that came with my room rate. <laughs> the police officers saw the logic in this, and I was escorted to the buffet. <laughs> the other hotel guests must have thought I was a mass murderer, given the number of police officers watching me eat scrambled eggs with chopsticks. <laughs> I was taken to Kashgar Airport and told to buy myself a flight out of town. Now in the movies, the guy getting deported never has to stop and pull out his credit card. So I dug in my heels and said, no, you're kicking me out. You buy the plane ticket. They refused, and for the next seven hours, I sat in Kashgar Airport with police officers watching me drink coffee. <laughs> now, my wife and colleague, Carolyn Wheeler, was in Beijing that day on her way to Scrum, Canada's visiting minister of transport, a guy named John Baird. The People's Daily asked Mr. Baird to comment on whether he thought the Canadian media was covering the Xinjiang riots properly. A very loaded question, but one that might have allowed Mr. Baird to comment on my situation. Mr. Baird, who you may have heard, is now Foreign Minister of Canada, replied there was, here's his quote, a lot of symmetry between the Chinese government's complaints about the Canadian media and his own cabinet's complaints about the Canadian media. <laughs> he said this while I was surrounded by police in Kashgar, not able to cover anything at all. So again, Canada should clearly support the rights of Chinese journalists because their interests, a freer society where the legal system is fairly applied, are Canada's interests and the interests of Canadian companies working in China, like the Globe and Mail. But back to this moment that China is facing, this chance that the new leadership has to change things. I definitely envy whoever becomes my successor in the Globe's Beijing Bureau. They will arrive in an era when it's easier than ever before to get to know the Chinese people. When Frederick Nassau, the first Globe and Mail correspondent in what we then called Peking, arrived in 1959, he wrote of being confined to his hotel near Tiananmen Square. He would wait for the telex machine that he kept in the bathroom to quake to life with the news, which most often was just the latest inflated statistics about agricultural production, or a missive hailing Sino-Soviet friendship. If Frederick Nassau wanted to go and interview people, he had to wait for his minder to take him to pre-selected interviewees, who would invariably tell him how marvelous life was in the People's Republic. Indeed, Mr. Nassau never reported on the famine of the Great Leap Forward that killed millions while he was one of the only foreign reporters in China. There was just no way for him to find out what was going on. Today you can just turn on Twitter or Facebook, and yes, many young Chinese do know how to reach them, despite the great firewall of internet restrictions. Or better yet, go to China's own Sina Weibo, with its 300 million, registered internet, with 300 million registered users. Or you can just walk down the Beijing streets and sit down beside whoever you want to talk to. Or you can spend three weeks on a train, talking to whoever sits beside you. You'll quickly read or hear news of the latest corruption scandal, or the standoff down the street, or the forced, forced demolition of a home whose owner is refusing to leave or the protest in the next village against environmental degradation. Since the 
Tiananmen Square crackdown 24 years ago, China has been governed by an informal pact between the Communist Party and the 1.3 billion people they govern. That pact boils down to, the economy will be opened, you'll be free to make, make your fortunes, just don't challenge our right to rule. Lawlessness and official corruption are threatening that pact. People don't believe they can keep what they have. They don't trust the system. It's that insecurity that motivated the Wukan uprising. No longer covered, it's the first dot, it's about a right. And, the other, and many of the other 180,000 protests a year. As I said at the beginning, change does not have to mean a Western-style democracy. But there must be a fairer China, and soon. One where the migrant workers who are born in the countryside can send their kids to the same schools and hospitals as those born in Beijing or Shanghai. There's a system right now called the Hukou system where if um, you can live and work in Shanghai for 10 years, but if you were born in the countryside, your kid has to go to a school in the countryside and has to go to the hospital in the countryside. A China where factories are forced to give their staff decent wages and working conditions. A China where you can discuss things freely on the internet without being afraid that the Public Security Bureau will pay you a visit. A China where the next Ai Weiwei is allowed to just be an artist, or the next Liu Xiaobo is just another grumpy writer trying to get published. Maybe, though not necessarily, a fairer China will be one that elects its own leaders. Either the Communist Party will lead that push towards fairness, and I think it will come in the next 10 years. And like I said, I've seen many positive signals that the new leadership at least intends to reform, or the Communist Party will be pushed into that reform. Change is coming, and Canada should decide what role it wants to play when the moment of change comes. Should we put our trust in Xi and Li, or should we speak up more clearly for the Liu Xiaobo's and Ai Weiwei's? This isn't just about human rights, it's about Canadian interests and what kind of China we want our pandas to grow up in 10 years from now. Thank you very much for listening and if you have an answer any questions. Thank you very much, Mark. We do have lots of time for questions. We have two microphones if people would like to line up to ask your questions. I'd only ask two things, please. One is to identify yourself and the second, please remember that we're asking questions. Uh, and so make them short and give Mark lots of time to respond. And if uh, I'll be the judge and decide if I think the question's going on a little too long, we'll ask you to get to the point. But otherwise, um, please. Thank you, Mark. My name is Herb Davis. I wonder if you could offer some more thoughts and comments uh, concerning the situation in Tibet and their quest for linguistic and religious freedom. And the second part of that question, if you had the opportunity to advise uh, Dr. Lapsang Songvi, the Prime Minister of the Government in Exile in Dharamsala, what to do to help facilitate greater dialogue or even some level of dialogue with China. How would the, what, what advice would you offer? Thank you. I wouldn't advise Dr. Sange. I'd advise the Chinese government that they should speak to the Dalai Lama while they can, because he is a moderating force, I think, I believe, on the Tibet independence movement, the Tibet autonomy movement. And he is the one that can make a deal that everyone will respect. And my previous posting was the Middle East, and everybody reviled Yasser Arafat, but he was the guy that could make the deal, and the guy that had they cut something with him, it would have gone ahead. Now, in terms of um, the situation in Tibet, I'm glad you asked about that, because um, you'll see where the, sort of how my trip dead ends before I get to Tibet. As a foreign journalist, uh, I can't go there. I haven't been able to go there for four and a half years. Um, I have a, my visa has markings in it that would not allow me to get on a plane or a train going to Tibet. I can report from the margins, Sichuan province and Qinghai province. Um, and I've spoken to a lot of monks and monasteries there who, um, they're terrified to speak to me, but they still want to tell me what they can. Um, they, they just, they feel very repressed, obviously. They don't, they, they deeply believe in their religion, that's why they're monks and they feel they're not allowed to express themselves that way, and they've been, they're having a, an, a, a, an education system crammed down their throats that tells them that the person they believe is the reincarnated Buddha is in fact a, a demon. It's a very, very difficult sell. Um, so uh, I wish I knew more about the situation. I wish they would open it up, then we could have a more balanced view than the one I'm giving you. And that's the sad truth is that I've never been. I'm worried, more worried that no one can reach Pyongyang, and I'll tell you that working in Beijing these days and asking them about North Korea. There's a definite frustration on the Chinese side about the North Koreans. They feel like they're not being listened to. And obviously, the regime in Pyongyang is entirely reliant on Chinese economic support and military support. And uh, they feel like they tried to tell the North Koreans not to do this last nuclear test in February, and the North Koreans ignored them. And ever since then, they've been sending messages to Pyongyang, and they're not getting 
the response they're used to. So there is there's some real concern in China about how this is developing. Um, my sense is that the North Koreans don't want a war. Um, they're trying to push this until they get what they really want, which is to sit down with the Americans face to face and have a discussion about aid, economic aid. But um, at the same time, there is a uh, with these cycles of, of rhetoric inside Pyongyang have always they usually end with something on fire on the other side. There is the attack on Yongkang Island in 2010 and the sinking of the Cheonan warship. These it's very difficult for North Korea to ramp up its domestic audience this high and not have some something on fire to show as a victory. So I worry that they're going there will, there will be something that will happen. And the South Koreans, I spent a lot of time in South Korea over the last few years, they're in the mood to punch back. And I don't know if the North Koreans understand that. And if they're not taking the call from Beijing, maybe they're not getting that message. So it is, it's very dangerous. I don't think we're on the brink of nuclear war, but I do think we're in a very on the edge of a very dangerous moment. Um, I was just reading that uh, China last year signed an agreement with Russia to purchase oil, paying them in yuan. What will this mean for global economics in terms of the petrodollar, the, the American dollar? That's a, you have to get one of the economics grads if there's any up here. But there is um, some, there definitely something they've been spending a lot of time on. They, they made a similar deal with the Brazilians to exchange um, directly with you know, without going to the middle currency of the U.S. dollar. They definitely want. They love the idea of the UN being a, an international currency. They have a bigger problem with anyone besides them setting the value of that currency. So you, can see, <laughs> you can see what the problem is. If you're going to be an international currency, it needs to be traded freely, and therefore they can't control the value, and then therefore they can't control prices at home. And the <coughs> underreported cause of the 1989 uh, protests in Tampa Square <coughs> was a spike in the price of pork. So um, if they can't control the price of pork, that's more terrifying to them than just about anything else. During your four years in uh, China, you must have observed on the periphery the military and what its activities are. Uh, Xi Jinping was uh, made the chairman of the CMC immediately, whereas his predecessor had nearly a two-year period of, uh, of meeting. I was wondering if you'd comment on military influence in the government and also make a comment about uh, the bold pushes that China is making, particularly in the South China Seas? It's a very good question. I think um, they're, they're linked, those two things that you brought up. I, When you look at the Diaoyu Islands dispute with, with Japan in particular, which is not the South China Sea, but the East China Sea, but I'm just making, <laughs> I find that one to be more indicative. I, I don't think that, um, I think the, 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 the actual incident, the purchasing of uh, three of the five islets from a Japanese citizen to the Japanese government wasn't actually that big a deal. In fact, it gave, you know, made it easier for the Japanese government to make a, to negotiate with them, with the Chinese if they chose to do so. But the Chinese chose to interpret this as a provocation and it pushed it quite a bit. And I think that was about, that was probably driven by hawkish elements of the PLA, the People's Liberation Army. I don't know that, uh, but the PLA officers that I've met are generally very hawkish and see these islands as absolutely fundamental. Um, I think that during the period where he was consolidating power, Xi Jinping was working very hard to appeal to that wing of the party so there would be no threat to the peaceful transition. Now that he's got all three of the levers, the presidency, the general secretary of the, of the Communist Party, and the head of the PLA, I think you might see, you're already seeing a bit of a, a backing down of the rhetoric. There's talks of a summit over the island, that sort of thing. Um, I think that uh, you know, the, the PLA is, you, you occasionally see pushes for the PLA to be taken outside of the Communist Party control to make it into a, a national army rather than what it is right now, which is the party's army. And the party, for uh, I think existential reasons, doesn't want that to happen. So it has to accept the PLA's influence inside the political structure. But, um, you know, I think that it spikes up at times like we just saw over the transition. I think it will now cool off a bit because their ability to influence events has waned now that the, um, the new Politburo Standing Committee is in place. Just a guess. Uh, Mark, I, I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, I wonder, however, if um, I, I used to teach uh, development studies for many, many years, and I used to ask students from China uh, that joined my class, what they thought was the key to China's rather remarkable success. And in most cases, almost all cases, the answer was um, liberalization of markets. And my answer to that was, well, I'm sure that had something to do with it without doubt. But 
there are more than 120 other developing countries, and most of them have more liberalized markets than China. And none of them, except for a couple of East Asian countries, have performed in a way which is even close. So I wonder, you have, you have focused on certain issues that are very important, but I wonder if I were to ask you the question, how do you account for China's remarkable, and of course China's collapse has been predicted yearly ever since the growth process started. The financial system is going to collapse, it's all a bubble. Uh, it's now a long way into this process. And I think um, I would like to hear how you understand that process. And I'd like to suggest that in looking at China, all of us also need to have some sense that stability is an enormously important uh, ingredient here. Uh, and the 97, 98 Asian financial crisis, Joseph Stiglitz, I remember, uh, s said just after the crisis, the world can thank its lucky stars that China hadn't liberalized its capital markets before 97, 98. So I would like very much to hear how you understand that. Um, and, and yeah, there are, are other developed economies that have done very well in, uh, oh, sorry, developing economies. South Korea obviously had a, a very rapid um, acceleration over the last uh, 20 years. So it, it, it's, it's easy to describe it all to, to state control. I'm not sure it's the entire answer. On, on stability, it, you're, you're absolutely correct. And um, at that press conference in the Great Hall of the People that we were uh, that I mentioned, where Li Keqiang gave his uh, first remarks, um, I was sitting beside a, a colleague from the Times of London, and uh, we were making some, some fairly cynical remarks. And he said, well, "All right, how would you do it? What would you do? How would you run this country of 1.3 billion people any different? Could you do, can you think of a better way to have the outcomes they've had?" I you know, it's very difficult to pretend that you can imagine a different course for the country that it's had right now. It's done, economically, it's done fairly well. I wasn't predicting its collapse, and maybe I, um, I took some paragraphs out as, a, as I was going to smooth the narrative. Maybe I smoothed it too much. I wasn't predicting its collapse. I was saying that they, the people feel the deal has been broken, and they have to maybe, maybe draw up a new social contract some way. Some, uh, and so a reform of the legal system, one in which the, the judiciary is made independent, um, or you, you loosen the social controls a little bit, can be can can assuage this popular anger that I'm talking about. Um, about a month ago, or two months ago, maybe the New York Times had a few articles about Chinese hackers getting into their network and their email accounts. And part of what the New York Times thought was going on was they were trying to figure out who their reporters were talking to in China. And I'm pretty sure I read after this, and it may have been on your Twitter account, that you've also had experiences with hackers getting in, trying to get into your email account. I was wondering if you could talk about how you and other journalists deal with this and, and what kind of problem this presents for reporting in China. Thanks very much. Um, yes, that was probably on my Twitter account. I didn't, like, when, when, all, when everybody else started saying, hey, it happened to me, I thought I should just chirp, chirp in because New York Times, the Wall Street Journal all did a story about how they'd been hacked. Um, in my case, it actually ties to that uh, prolonged story that I was telling about how I had gone to, uh, written a story about how the immigration consulting process had worked. and. Um, there was an effort to get my note, to get me hand over my notebooks and recordings from that. And after I flew to Bangkok and couriered things back home, I came up and one day I opened up my computer, and every file that had anything related with the word China in it had it hadn't disappeared from my laptop, which would have made more sense, but it had uh, it now had zero KB. You open it, it was still there. It'd be a file called you know Immigration Consulting. I click on it, and it would just be blank. And my files that related to Japan, my files that related to Thailand, were all intact. So I brought in the Canadian Embassy's um, uh, computer expert. I invited him if you'd come by and have a look. And he said, whatever this is, someone has designed this specifically for you and your computer. This is you know, a very targeted attack. So you can guess at who might have had the motivations to do that. Um, it was a lesson. They also got my contact list. Um, the phone numbers, email addresses, everybody I'm in contact with. I mean, I'm sure they had most of those anyways. We, you have to assume that most of your phone calls are uh, monitored, if you're, especially if you're calling anyone like an IOA way. I'm pretty sure they. Both lines are being tapped at that point, but uh, it is you know since then I've had to be a lot more careful with uh, you know being a little more old-fashioned, keeping things in notebooks and such. Um, with the emergence of social media sites like you mentioned, Weibo, and uh, the increased uh, internet access of the average Chinese citizen, I was wondering what kind of social and political effects you've noticed um, while you were in China. Uh, what sort of effects that's had on it? and uh, what you think is in store for the future. The, 
if previously people only had access to um, what was in the People's Daily, what was on CCTV, and that was pretty dry <coughs> stuff and pretty controlled stuff. And now Weibo is censored to a certain extent, and, and uh, the history of Weibo, for those who aren't familiar with it, is uh, in 2009, um, on the 20th anniversary of uh, Tiananmen Square, there was a whole, these campaigns started to build up online on, on the Chinese, uh, Chinese users on, on Twitter in particular, and Facebook as well, trying to raise awareness of what had happened. So both these websites were blocked inside China. So Weibo emerged almost simultaneously. I think it actually existed, but it suddenly shot up in popularity. And the way they've avoided getting the same treatment is they self-censor. They have a, I've met someone um, who works not for them, but for Baidu, and he explained that they have a, a system where if someone uses, uses the word, say, or Tiananmen Massacre, it just goes away. It never happened. If you use some code they think might be referring to that, it gets put into an icebox and some, until a human sort of sensor can look at it and decide if your intention is right or wrong, and then if it's okay, they'll toss it back in. So it, it's very, it's still a controlled sphere. However, it, it, the conversations that are having there and the way they go and the speed of it, even if they do get censored, some of these, um, you know, if it's only there for, for five minutes before it disappears, 200 other people might retweet it and put it on their account. So that <laughs> things are getting out in a way they can't control anymore. And, and these, um, the Wukan uprising, the, the popular protest that I went to, was all done, was organized by bloggers, really. And that's in a tiny fishing village in Guangdong. So you can see the potential for change and the, and the threat that poses to the government. And actually, the government's trying to respond. They've ordered um, bureaucrats to start opening up their own Weibo accounts and to get involved in, in social, bureau, uh, social um, uh, what are we, what's the word I'm looking for, sort of public governance. So it, it, it's incredibly important. I don't think we know where it goes yet. And I think that what um, the role of the heads of companies like Baidu and Sina do from here. I mean, they, they have an enormous amount of power, and as long as they're compliant and doing what the government wants them to do, it's, you know, it's all stays within the, the old boundaries. But what if one day they decided not to censor? Um, there's, there's a bunch of other cyber sort of issues like IP theft and all these sorts of things. I mean, it's hard to get your head around. And, and my question to you would be, um, what recourse do you think Western governments have against this sort of thing? And is it being taken seriously at the domestic level in China? Do the leaders sort of, is this on the, well, I'm sure it's on the radar, but do they have any sort of plan, or do they acknowledge it publicly that it's happening, and is there something that can be done about it? They don't acknowledge publicly that it's happening, and it's important, I think, to know that the building that this, these cyber attacks was, were emanating from, or allegedly emanating from, was said it was the People's Liberation Army. So we talked a minute ago about the sort of separate sphere that the People's Liberation Army has carved out. Now, does the People's Liberation Army seek the approval of the civilian oversight before it goes and steals something from the Pentagon? I don't know. Um, if you go to the press, you know, the, I, one of the paragraphs that I skipped over was that um, the Chinese government, for all the, the openness that my successor will encounter in this great new atmosphere I'll be coming into, the Chinese government remains a very closed entity. The, um, you know, very few people, last year when they were changing over their uh, power structure, there were very few people who knew no one knew until the very last minute who the seven new leaders would be. There were no inside sources. There was no way to break through. So you really just have to go to the aforementioned press conferences and ask. And you get a, you get a, their stable response is, well, you know, we're deeply concerned about these cyber attacks. You can't prove they came from China. And China is the number one victim of, China, of cyber attacks. So they, they immediately turn around and say, they're doing it to us. We're doing it to them. Maybe they are. I don't know if any if any media companies are investigating whether or not the Pentagon is hacking into China at the same time as China. So maybe this is just the way you know, sort of, the new Cold War is being waged. But um, yeah, I mean, for for companies, and I've read some some you know, truly scary stuff about companies that sort of got you know they're being hacked by basically losing their entire um, you know their, their everything they owned to invisible hackers from somewhere. They're, the Chinese have made noises about let's have a conversation about this, let's strike a deal. Again, implying that it's a two-way street, and if, they, if we're gonna stop, everybody has to stop. I don't know what the truth is in that one. I just wanted your assessment on the, what the reaction has been in China on the government's new investment, the conservative government's new investment, uh, foreign investment rules, particularly kind of the message of hands off our oil sands after, after the CNOC investment, but also the concerns raised here about uh, Chinese telecom companies coming to Canada. And has there been much reaction? What has been that reaction been in China, but also what does that mean to the, you think to the Canada-China relationship, and should people here be worried about those companies coming here? Because even the Conservative government split amongst its caucus as to whether or not there should be worry, and I'd like your assessment on it. I'll tell you that after the Nexon Sinoff deal, I went to one of the negotiators um, on the Chinese side, and he was delighted. 
he didn't, and I, I expected him to be angry about the aforementioned sort of hands off our oil sands, because he also, he, he focused on the exception, except in exceptional circumstances, I'm sure you know the language better than I do. It, so he, they were delighted because someone had set up a playbook after they'd been rebuffed by the Australians, by the Americans, someone had said, this is how you do a deal and here's the circumstances under which it can be done. They were actually very grateful to the Harper government for setting up a, a playbook that they could take to the Australians and say, listen, if we do what we did in Canada, if we make the concessions we made in Canada, if we overpay like we did in Canada, can we do this? <laughs> As for Huawei and, and sort of the Chinese companies, that, uh, the telecoms companies, it's, it's, it's akin to the cyber, uh, the cyber spying allegations. The Chinese get extremely defensive. Um, and I, I didn't properly answer the, your question about the domestic audience and how do, what do people think about it at home. And mo they, when they, they allege the American attacks, most Chinese believe, yeah, I'm sure the Americans are doing this too. <coughs> and so they say, you know, Huawei is um, uh, this company that's hacking into, uh, or there's, there's a threat to the security of, of Western governments. They just say, this is, you know, this is American, so they're trying to protect Apple or trying to protect so their own companies. I mean, domestically, they just say this is all Western propaganda. There isn't very much women's political involvement in China. Um, there was uh, one. Uh, I sat in the uh, um, uh, in the great hall of people, and they were doing their voting for all the different committees. And they would have the names of the candidates up. And uh, of course, the voting is you know there there'd be like 18 Communist Party candidates, and 17 are going to get seats. Mm -hmm. But for whatever reason, I didn't quite understand. They would always have in brackets Nuren, woman, if the candidate was a woman on the board on the screen, in case people didn't know that was a woman that influenced their voting somehow. Uh, there was one woman, uh, Liu Yandong, who was considered a candidate for the Politburo Standing Committee, and people just refer to her as the woman. So it tells you how rare and exceptional she is. Um, I don't know if you had a chance to watch the footage of China's first female taikonaut uh, landing back on Earth. And uh, so it, the, the, the uh, capsule lands, and I think it was in Qinghai province, and out comes first the first male pilot, and then the second male pilot, which sort of was a bit counterintuitive. And then they sort of hoisted out the third one. They're going, oh, she's a woman. This is the CCTV on that. She's a commentator saying, oh, she's a woman. Her legs will probably be a bit wobbly now. <laughs> and what a glorious smile. That's the great thing about female astronauts, is they have great smiles. It was really quite, and, this was, and, and you know, I'm sitting there in a, in a newsroom full of mostly Chinese people, and, and I was the only one who was really sort of thought this is a shocking, you know, this is the way the official media still talks about women. So. Um, the interesting character is Peng Liuan. She's the new uh, first lady of China, and she's um, forced in her own right for the first. She, you know, they, they call her the Chinese Michelle Obama. I think that might be a bit strong, but um, I know she. When they landed in Moscow, um, she she got off the plane beside Xi Jinping, and she looked very uh, kind of like she was part of the team, like she was, you know, his uh, partner. We'll see how much that happens because that's that's actually a new development. We've never seen. I never saw the wife of Hu Jintao or Wen Jiabao. And, I wouldn't about his wife is quite rich, I know that, but... Uh. <laughs> My question also touches on the um, foreign acquisition, well, the Chinese acquisition of the next thing. Um, I'm wondering, in the midst of the FIFA agreement and increased um, interaction between the Canadian and Chinese economies, there's been this um, national debate with regard to foreign acquisition of Canadian companies, particularly with regard to the oil and gas industry. What do you think the Chinese acquisition of Nexon means for the Canadian economy, and what do you think of the Harper government's position um, given the um, Chinese acquisition of Nexon? I think the answer that they eventually gave, that, uh, or, or, or not so much the answer they gave, but one of their points that they made when they were considering it all, that you know, why did we get the Canadian state out of uh, the oil, uh, out of the oil and gas business, if it was just going to be other states, governments coming in, it was supposed to be the private sector and all the energy that that would unleash that they wanted to have in there. <coughs> energy, if you know what I mean. Um, I think there's uh, something to watch for, though. There, I mean, in, why why does the Chinese government want Nexon? And and they're you're, you're starting to see them where they're the resources will be in the production will be Chinese owned. They're looking to buy into the pipelines that ship them and the terminals of the port. So if they get to a point where they control the production, the transport, and the, uh, the port, then surely that gives them a say in, in, in what happens to the oil when it's bought and sold. At least that's the Chinese calculation. They're, 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 they're playing well down the field and looking at a moment when they need to play those cards, say, hey, you know, we, we paid for the right to say what happens to this. Um, so I do think there are some serious questions raised by um, having a foreign government buy 
of uh, natural resources that you guys are own government out of. I'm wondering what uh, you've seen about the implications of the one-child policy and the shortage of women in China. That's a very good question, and um, it is absolutely when you talk about uh, human rights, or I mean, that is the first issue that comes up for ordinary Chinese. That's the one thing that bothers them perhaps more than anything else. The the, the fact that the number of children that they can have has been predetermined. Now, if you had anyone from the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences here, they would tell you what a great success the policy has been, and that how the number, how the China is already so huge, and how could they possibly be any bigger population-wise than they are? But um, yeah, it is a. Uh, it's um, the one thing I would say is that I'm going to stop writing that China is about to change its one-child policy because I've had that story. I've written it in the Globe and Mail twice. I've seen it in every other newspaper, you know, four or five times in the last four years. It's a constant, almost expectation that they have to fix this policy, especially with the demographic problems that they have coming towards them, with um, an aging society and the fact that you know you're going to have one grandchild expected to support sort of two parents, maybe four grandparents. You know, they need to have more young people in the country, and yet there's still this is this policy that is almost beyond question at the highest levels. Um, and on the question about the uh, dwindling number of women, I was in a village on this train trip, which um, I'd say there were, I think I wrote there were 80 men and uh, no women in the entire village, because the village that were there, uh, the few women that had grown up there had all gone away to go work in factories or what have you. And it's, we talk about anger in the countryside. Imagine 80 men growing up in a village with no women. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a problem someday. Maybe that's a good note on which to end it. I'm not really sure. But anyway, um, thank you very much for coming this evening. Um, I'd like to thank on behalf of all of you, Mark, for coming to Canada for a few days to talk to us, to give us an incredible insight into what has gone on. He's been in China in a wonderful period of time to see the changes that have taken place. And I think he's given us this evening a bit of a sense of things we can look forward to and maybe he can watch from London as well. So uh, on behalf of all of us, Mark, thank you very much for coming tonight.